Uh, we have one son together, and then I have three stepkids. Uh, so, and pretty close to, to where we live, except for one stepdaughter lives in Florida. But just gives an opportunity for my wife to fly to Florida and enjoy good weather for a while, uh, which she does. So, uh, so uh, one correction. Uh, if you would, uh, the first page, at, uh, as part of the invocation, the first line there uh, says, this afternoon. Now, uh, you know, I'm pretty traditional Lutheran. Uh, down in Bella Vista, there's a lot of Baptists. Uh, you might be here till the afternoon if I was a Baptist preacher, but I don't think you want to. If we have some goodies to eat afterwards, I don't think that's going to uh, suffice for lunch. So it should be, of course, uh, morning. Also, I'm gonna, I, I see a lot of kids, and uh, I decided that we would go ahead and have a, kid, a children's message this morning, and that'll come right before the last hymn of the kids' message. And Marcus has agreed to uh, bring up a little object for me, and that's what I'll make my kids' message about, so, with, with your help. I'll ask the kids for help if I get stuck, if I start asking a lot of questions, then you know I'm stuck. Now, uh, in the years I've been doing this, I've, I've been doing that for like 35 years, and uh, I think the hardest one was when somebody brought up a, a horse brush. That one was a stumper for me. So sometimes I ask, when the congregation starts laughing at me, uh, I will ask the people in the congregation to come up with ideas. So. <laughs> You need to think too. So, uh, any questions? We we can visit afterwards a little bit more. So, God's blessings on your worship this morning. Thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. 
Physically, we hunger and thirst each day. Each day, we Christians hunger and thirst for Christ's forgiveness, which is the only true way to stand before Christ and enter into his heaven. So we confess our sins of omission and commission, thoughts, words, and deeds. God, of mercy and compassion, listen to my confession. I am a sinner. I come to you and say pretty much the same thing St. Paul says. For what I do is not the good I want to do, nor the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. We continue with prayer. May I know what Paul knows, that forgiveness is in Christ. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Your Heavenly Father has had mercy on you and has given Jesus Christ to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in his name, he gives power to become children of God, and he promises you his Holy Spirit. Of the men and the women and those who could understand. 
and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and, the, and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, this talks about how, you know, all of us are different. We're all different in different ways. Uh, we all have different talents. We all have different gifts. Uh, we all have a, a purpose here in life, though. And that purpose is to be one, to be one in Christ. And the Holy Spirit has made us such. Now, sometimes we don't get along with each other, but that's expected. It happened in the early church. It happens today. But we have one thing in common, and that is Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, the one who uh, has us reconciled to his Father and who helps us to reconcile with each other. 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, there would be, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you or again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which are our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there be no division in the body, but that members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And now you are the body of Christ and the individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. Here ends our reading. As you're able, please rise for the reading of the gospel. The gospel is taken from Luke chapter uh, 4. This is where Jesus uh, comes to his hometown. And he speaks a uh, word to them, and uh, they don't like it. They don't like the, they like the words initially, but when he basically says, "I'm not going to do the great things here in my hometown that I did other places," you see, a lot of the people there wanted him to do these things. They kind of put his town on the map, and when he refused to do that, they got mad, and they were ready to throw him off a cliff and kill him. Of course, his time hadn't come yet. 
So he walks amongst them and, and gets away from the possible death. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the, all the, the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Here ends the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> Jesus replied, 
How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on him and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up to his feet, and he stood up. Dear friends in Christ, since uh, the end of May, I, I got a new title. It's called Emeritus. Now, I don't, that, Emeritus, that's a, a Latin term. And it means pasture put out the pasture. I love being in the pasture. I love being out in this pasture. Because I got two good pastures that are bringing me God's word. I have a DCE that brings me God's word as well through the children's message. Uh, there, there's so much about the pasture I like. I like to be able to have a choice of what I'm going to wear in the morning before I go to church. If I want to wear a good pair of blue jeans, I wear a good pair of blue jeans. So I love the pasture. There's another bit about the pasture I like. Golf. Down at Bella Vista, Arkansas, where we retired six golf courses. Anybody here a golfer? It's a golfer's heaven. Six 18-hole golf courses, two nine-hole, <coughs> one of which is free. You can go to the driving range free. Of course, you pay for it for those little fees you have every year. Uh, but And I, I, I'm golfing a lot more now. And if you don't know anything about golf, I'm going to explain a little bit. I'm right-handed, and I'm teeing the ball up, and I'm hitting it. And if it goes to the left, it's a hook. If it goes to the right, it's a slice. If it goes down the middle and long, what is it? Miracle. A miracle. <laughs> and I, don't get, I don't get too many miracles, I'll tell you that. Uh, but my golf needs help. So how am I going to get help? Well, I need to step up a little bit anyway. I can read books. Uh, I can ask the guys I golf with, because sometimes, you know, if you ever golf with people, they're ready to tell you what's wrong. You're lifting your head up, you're doing this, or do this instead, and whatever. I, I can talk to them about it. I can take some uh, lessons from the pro, or like a lot of golfers, a new set of clubs, that'll do it. I get a new set of clubs and my game will improve by 10 strokes or whatever. Our souls need help. As a golfer, I need help. But that's an earthly thing. When it comes to our help, our soul needs heavenly help. It needs help forgiving, knowing that you're forgiven through Christ, that you're saved, that you're going to heaven. All those things, and heavenly things, those are what really matters. And that's where we really need help. Now, where did all that start? Where did that helplessness all start? It started with our parents. They tried and failed to help themselves to more knowledge. And look what it got them. Now, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Now, I'm not alluding to whether what kind of fruit that was on that tree, but you know what I mean. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We like to try to help ourselves, but there's some things we can't help ourselves with. And really, we're very helpless when it comes to those heavenly matters, so we need help. But we're not hopeless, and we got the help. Jesus is the one who is our helper. 
We see in the story that I just read here about a very helpless man and his helpless son. He had brought his son to the disciples to have them cast out this demon out of, their, out of his son. Well, Jesus wasn't there at that point, but the disciples had been doing this. And that and a bunch of other stuff uh, he was doing, uh, they were doing miraculous stuff. And but this boy, nothing was going. The disciples weren't cutting it. And so Jesus comes along. He knows what's going on. But he asks the guys to fill him in on what's going on. And the father tells him the whole story. If you can do anything, have compassion and help us. And Jesus, I like Jesus' response there. If? If? If I can help? All things are possible for one who believes, Jesus responds. And immediately the father yells, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. And then the miracle. Jesus casts out the demon, and it's the demon's turn to yell. And the boy who seemed to be dead was now alive and well because Jesus gave him a helping hand. When we look into the mirror, we see somebody like that father or like that child. We see one helpless individual. Because we are dead. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. We are like walking dead. And then Jesus arrives. He doesn't need to be filled in. He knows what's going on in our life. He knows everything that's going on in our life. And he knows these people need compassion. These people need a helping hand. And he gives us that helping hand. He lifts us up and he gives us saving faith, bringing us, uh, baptizing us in his death and resurrection. He gets us off on the right foot. You see, here we're, we're not standing at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're standing at the tree of life because Jesus would suffer and die for all our sins on that tree of life. That tree of life that was in the garden must have been a very ugly tree. This tree that Jesus died on that gives us life is a very ugly tree. And how it's part of his nature. It's always a part of his nature to help people. It was when he was here on earth. He is the same thing now. He is here for us to help us, to give us a helping hand. And he does that. He does that through his word. He does it through his sacraments. He does it through each and every one of us. As uh, Paul talked about in the Corinthians text for today, we're one body. We are one body. When there's one part of the body, we're hurting for that. We weep with those who weep, and we rejoice with those who rejoice. Because we're here to help each other, to be good neighbors. And being good neighbors out in that world it starts here. It starts with our family. But, he gets, but Jesus gives us a helping hand because he knows what's going on in our hearts and our minds. And maybe there's something going on in your heart and mind right now. Something that's really heavy duty. You are remiss to talk about it. Maybe you don't even want to talk about it with your pastor. That sometimes is understandable. We have it in our minds that if I tell my pastor, then when he preaches, he's going to be thinking of me. Well... Sometimes the pastor hits squarely in your heart and he doesn't even know what's going on in your life. So maybe you're at that point right now. You're hurting in some way. You're not sure that, you know, things look so ugly. Is it really going to turn out all right? You've tried every avenue. You keep hitting dead ends all the time. You, you try to live by that axiom, God helps those who help themselves. I don't know who came up with that. It's not from Scripture. We try that, though. We keep trying and, and, until we finally give up. And maybe that's where we need to be. We need to be totally helpless and feel hopeless as well. Because then there's only one that we can go to. And that is Jesus Christ. If you can do anything, Lord, do it. 
That's what we sometimes say to God. If you can do it, do it. Our yell becomes like that father's yell. I believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus is filled in, and he knows what's going on inside your hearts and your minds. He knows that, that when you struggle in your faith, you have backed away from the tree of life, and you are at that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's a deadness in us. We need lifting up. So he gives us a helping hand. He's always willing to give us a helping hand. And how do we know that it's helping? Because of the cross scars and its wrists. That's help. It can come from a friend. It can come from your pastor. It can come through uh, reading God's word and hearing God's word. Uh, it can come through a relative. It certainly comes to us in God's word and the promises. What's the great promise he gives us in the great commission? That he is with us always to the very end of the age. And of course, Psalm 23 is a, is a beautiful way to describe how God walks with us as the good shepherd. But how he works it out, how long it takes for him to work it all out, there's a lot of the questions. And that's where a lot of our doubts come in, because we don't know exactly what's ahead of us. We don't know how God's going to work it out. But we know this. No matter how many questions there are to our situation, he is always, always compassionate. You are going to struggle to trust him. I struggle to trust him. There are times when I'm worried about things. Going to bed with things on my mind. I might get to sleep for a while. I wake up and I'm worried about this or that. We're going to struggle. He's always going to have compassion for us. There's no question about that. There might be a question on how everything's going to work out, but there's going to be no question that he is compassion for us. Do you ever struggle with past sin or sins? The feeling of forgiveness just isn't there. And, and that's a key thing, feeling. The feelings come and go, you know, like happiness. Happiness is not an ongoing thing. It's kind of a this and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's a feeling. Feelings are not facts. Uh, maybe the guilt, the shame is really bugging you. Uh, Satan has a way of uh, keep bringing it up with us because he, he likes us when we struggle with our faith because he eventually wants to get us away from the faith altogether. And, and then there's that, some people say, uh, well, I'm having a hard time forgiving myself. If it's a question of forgiving ourselves, then what's the purpose of God? If it's just a matter of us forgiving ourselves, then God really doesn't need to be a part of our life, does he? No, the real issue here is moving forward, trusting him. Trusting, going to that tree of life. Because when we don't trust him, we're backed up and we're backed up to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, away from the tree of life. And there, who's there at that tree? Satan. Satan's there. And he's bringing all kinds of doubt. Man, he, he is eating away at that lack of trust that's struggling with our faith. And he gives us similar questions that he gave to Adam and Eve. Did God really say you're forgiven even of that ugly sin? Did God really say that he removed his sins from you as far as the east is from the west? Did God really say that he forgets your sin? He's, he remembers he knows everything. Why would he forget your sins? Go doubt. And the struggle with faith gets worse. When I'm golfing alone, and sometimes I do that, I kind of take things into uh, matters into my own hands. You see, I do this, and sometimes do that, or hit it into the water, or whatever. So when I hit it in the woods down there, I'd say, well, I'm not going in there. there. There's snakes in there. There's ticks. Nah, 
I'll play another ball here. I'll give myself a free shot. Sometimes I give myself a lot of free shots. Why? Uh, the term in uh, golf is uh, a mulligan. It's a Scottish word. It means free. And if you ever golf in a golf tournament where they charge you for mulligans, that, that, that's just not right. Nobody should be charged. It's free. This is a Scottish game. Let's play by the rules. Free is free. I deserve to really have a bad score. But I like to make myself feel a little better. It's easy to take sins into our own hands as well. We deny that we sin. I didn't do anything wrong. We blame others. Hmm. That sounds like our father and mother, doesn't it? Now what did they do? Eve blamed Satan. Of course Satan's going to be there. Yeah, but uh, we don't have to do what Satan tells us to do or suggest. And, and Adam, he blamed God. But, you know, the woman, you made me. She made me eat of this fruit. So we have a way of... Uh, I'm dropping my microphone stuff. Um, we have a way of, of easily blaming somebody else for what went on in our lives and our mistakes that we made, the sins. Uh, it's uh, uh, easy to uh, uh, call a sin something other than a sin. We see this a lot on television, don't we? A politician or an actor or actress, I mean, they really mess up. They committed a sin or sins. And they call it a mistake. Uh, 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 they didn't. Their judgment was wrong, or something like that. That's what they apologize for. And we can torture ourselves with guilt and shame, and that's all a trust issue. And then Jesus opens up his arms, and he invites us to go to the tree of life. And there, on that tree of life, are mulligans galore, forgiveness, forgiveness. In John 1.1, 1, 1, John called it grace upon grace. More grace than we even realize or need. Just a lot of grace. And, and one place in the Bible, Old Testament, talked about uh, God giving double forgiveness for people's sins. More than enough forgiveness for our sins. He started a good work in us. He started that good work in baptism. He's going to keep up that good work, and he's going to keep on forgiving us and, and relieving us of the guilt and shame and realizing on that tree of life, he is taking care of all that. There is no ifs about that. When we face death, we can struggle with unbelief and trusting in his word and promises. There are so many unknowns, so many questions. What if we need to do more good works to be able to get into heaven? Well, we could always do a lot more good works. That's for the benefit of people around us, our neighbor. Not for God's benefit, but for the neighbor. We can't do any more good works to get to heaven than, than the good work that Christ has done for us. What if our lifestyle hasn't been good enough? Or something from my days when I was a teenager and wild and crazy and did some uh, bizarre things, bad things. Uh, what if those are too bad for God to forgive? I remember one individual in my uh, congregation in Illinois. He was dying of cancer. He knew it. He was on his deathbed. He lived a half hour away from where I was in Quincy. And his wife gives me a call one day. This is probably about a month before he died. He's worried. He doesn't know if he's going to get to heaven or not. So the first thing that came into my mind was when John the Baptist was in prison. You know, he was close to death at this point. And he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the man? Are you the one? Now, you know, us pastors, we don't always agree on everything. And we get into discussions about stuff that, that may not have an exact answer to it, but we all have this speculation and things like that. And, and the question is, did John send the disciples to find out? Or was it did he do it for the sake of the disciples? Or was it for all of them? We don't know the real answer to that. 
to what ifs and the faithless, uh, faithless thoughts. They make death scary. I just came back from a funeral of a friend who was the same age as I am. I come home and I tell Lori I'm going to make plans for my funeral so it's a lot easier for you. That's not morbid. The plans are good because it focuses on Jesus. We don't have to be afraid of death. We really don't. When Jesus hit the trail to the cross, he was not afraid of death. He knew exactly what he was headed for. He was going to take on the heavy load of the world's uh, worlds of sins. He was going to take get the heavy hand of his own father because his own father was going to have to punish him for our sins. And he was going to take the heavy hand of the Romans and everyone else that was his enemy, enemy on earth. But he did not shy away from it. There was no ifs that entered into his mind. He started the good work in us, and he started that good work of saving us, and he finished the job. All those sins, all our sins, every one of them. There is no unforgivable sin. It's not abortion. It's not having sex out of wedlock. There is no unforgivable sin except for unbelief. When we die, Jesus will give us a great helping hand and lift us up to him to all eternity. And when he comes in the end, it will be even more glorious because it will be our body and soul together. We will be like Jesus and we will get to enjoy the glory that he presently has right now. There is no ifs about it. The scars in his hands are proof. There are no ifs about it. We can help ourselves with many things. We can help ourselves with golf. We can, we can help ourselves with uh, cooking a certain recipe by looking on the internet or uh, whatever. We can help ourselves with a lot of different things. Uh, my retirement, things like that. People always need help with that. But the holy things, the holy things, that's where a helper comes in. He's going to help us. And there's no ifs about it. And so each and every day, we can really cry the same thing that Father cried. I believe. Help my unbelief. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
rise. We join in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From the events he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. At the end of each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you respond, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God and Christ Jesus for all people according to their needs. Lord God of Zion, we give you thanks and you have, that you have risen to show pity to our fallen world, setting us free from our sin and death. And Christ, the appointed time of favor has come for all people. Cause your name to be declared among all peoples, that your grace may not be rejected in our time, but received with delight in every place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, your people, in the days of Ezra the priest, return to your word with attentive ears. Give us eagerness to hear your word with understanding, that our days may be sanctified and your commandments put into practice among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Father, you have arranged us as members of one body in Christ Jesus. Free us from jealousy or contempt toward our fellow Christians. Lead us to bestow honor on our weaker brothers, to suffer and rejoice together, and to serve in harmony as those baptized in one spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, bless all families and homes, that one generation may tell to the next the wonderful works of God in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O oh God, give wisdom and courage to all who govern our communities and country that they may lead well, following your will rather than man's whims. Grant us willingness to support them with our prayers and encourage them. Lord, in your mercy. <coughs> Gracious and compassionate Lord, comfort those who mourn the family of uh, Pastor Horky, uh, the family of Heather uh, Hayes Stinnett, and uh, the uh, family of Steve Beachley. As our great physician, mend the bodies and uplift the spirits of all in need, especially for Mike Van uh, John, John Mark and Beulah Lambert, and for anyone else that we know that is in need of physical care. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O Lord, your Son has come with favor to deliver us, and in his blessed sacrament he brings cleansing and strength. Give faith to us all that we would not despise our Savior in this Holy Communion. And do not pass through us and go away as a Nazareth, but dwell among us graciously. Lord, in your mercy. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in the response of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Father, like children, can go to their earthly father in confidence, also can go to our heavenly Father, and since he is in heaven, he can do more than we can think or task. Hallowed be thy name. God's name is how he makes himself known to us. We pray that we keep his name holy, that we shun false doctrine and unchristian conduct, and teach the Bible in truth. We pray that while on earth we live as believers in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and that when we die, he takes us to himself in heaven. God's will is that all be saved. We recognize that the fact that the world, the devil, and our flesh oppose God's will in our lives and the lives of all people. We pray the Lord walk with us in all our endeavors. 
This is the only petition which centers around the needs of physical. We recognize that God is the giver of all gifts, both physical and spiritual. A trespass is a sin. We sin and are forgiven for Christ's sake. We are praying that the Holy Spirit empowers us to forgive those who sin against us, as Christ has forgiven us. Temptation does not come from God, but from Satan. Temptation is forever trying to seduce us into unbelief, despair, and sin of every kind. We ask God to keep the devil and the temptation from us. God, Jesus alone has the power to grant our, our prayer. We alone are to give him praise and glory. Amen means yea, yea, it shall be so. Okay, anything else to, uh, to this? 
Did you write it or anything? Nope, it's just a cross, but I wore it out, and I just have always kept it in my Bible. She's 23 now, in almost in graduate school. Oh, wow. She's my... Not a little girl anymore. Okay, let's see here. I'm thinking of uh, the epistle text for today where it talked about a body. Um, anybody here got any owies? I used to have owies. Um, right there. You can see the scar. You got any scars? This hand went through a window. You have a scar? Yeah. Right there in the forehead? What happened? Okay, were you playing? Okay. Running, okay, hit a crack or something. And, okay. Um, I have another one too. I, I don't really like to brag about this one. <laughs> we can brag about uh, some scars, you know. This one's around my finger. When I was uh, almost five, my sister was pulling a lawnmower. You ever seen one of those lawnmowers that have blades that go like this? You had to push it. And my sister and another gal were uh, pulling it. And I decided I was going to try to find out how sharp it was. So I stuck my finger in it. My mom was across the street yelling at me, but of course I didn't hear her. She knew exactly what I was going to do. And she was over there uh, to give me a helping hand. Well, let's talk about a helping hand. Now, uh, you know, I talked a lot about Jesus helping us out. And sometimes we need, we need other people. We need Jesus people to help us out. Like... Uh, uh, Okay, when, when I got my owies, when I stuck my finger in the lawnmower, who helped me out? What? My mom was part of it. Who else? I think my sister, she was a year younger than I was, so I think she was freaking out. I mean, I was bleeding really bad. Who else, who else can help me out? Jesus was, because he was there with me, he made sure I got through that all right. Who else? There was a quote that Jesus said, you would quote to me, physician, heal thyself. So when you're hurt really bad, where would you go? Doctor, yeah, you go to the doctor. See, the reason I got this scar is I got stitches all the way around my finger. So he stitched it up so I wasn't bleeding anymore. So. It takes all kinds of people to help us out. And Paul was talking about that in the, thank you, Marcus. Paul was talking about that in the Bible, uh, Corinthians 1, where he talked about you know, the foot can't say to the rest of the body, I don't need you, or uh, the, the little finger might say, uh, I, I'm not good enough for the rest of the body. When part, when part of your, fan, uh, your body is hurting, the whole part hurts. A whole part has compassion. And so when uh, you know we pray for people in church, and we pray for them in our life, uh, outside of church as well, and sometimes we, we find a neighbor that uh, uh, maybe their spouse died or somebody else died, and we take them some food or something like that. So it really takes a, a, a whole bunch of people to help each other out. That's how Jesus works. He works through, through all of us. It doesn't matter. You, you know, you, you might think you're kind of small and you really can't help anybody. But no, sometimes the, the very things that little kids say to adults says so much more than sometimes what adults can say. We get right down to the basics. You know, we, we know that when we get an owie, mom kisses it and it feels better. Or, or if we get worse, we go to the doctor and he helps us out. So. It, it takes a whole body to help each other out because when we lose somebody important to us, we like to know that somebody else is uh, feeling for us, that they have compassion for us and are praying for us. And uh, while they can't take the pain away, uh, they can certainly help us to deal with that pain in a way that uh, we need to do. So you might join me in a prayer. And everybody follow me. I'll just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Thank you for being my helper. Thank you for going to the cross. Your scars on your hand 
Show me that you have compassion on me. Help me to be compassionate to others. And show you as the great physician. Amen. Thank you for coming up. Thank you, Marcus.